Hello and welcome to the second episode in our series, State of the Election. Between coronavirus, the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police officers and the massive and sometimes violent protests that followed, it's hard to remember that the 2020 presidential election is still moving forward. And if history tells us anything, it's that elections are not a business of certainty. So in this video, we're going to explore what effect the current situations will have on Donald Trump's re-election chances. We've talked about our States with Shoes designs a few times before, and we've told you that you can buy some of the designs on merch. Well, I have good news. We've expanded the States with Shoes merchandise collection, meaning that 36 states now have official TLDR merch, and the others are coming soon. You can find those designs and all of the items they come on by heading to our merch store. It's linked down below. So far, the election season has been largely focused on the Democratic primaries. And it's worth noting that while Biden is the only Democrat left standing after besting nearly two dozen of his fellow candidates and thus the presumptive Democratic nominee, that process is still technically ongoing. At the time of writing, Biden has secured about 97% of the delegates required to clinch the nomination, and primaries were held on Tuesday in Indiana, Maryland, Montana, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Dakota, and the District of Columbia. Biden's choice for running mate is also still up in the air. As you may know, Biden did commit to choosing a woman as his running mate, and several weeks ago, we posted a video exploring six potential female running mates for Biden. That said, we won't rehash those candidates, but there's a link to that video in the description if you want to know more. What we will say is that several candidates seem to be campaigning for the job, probably none more so than former Georgia gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams. So, let's take a look at some of the other candidates that we haven't covered yet. Florida Representative Val Demings is a former Orlando police chief and one of the house managers during the failed impeachment attempt of Donald Trump. Given the recent situation surrounding the death of George Floyd, Demings could provide a voice for a potential Biden administration to address the brutal police practices around the country, especially given her law enforcement background. Another advantage that Demings could bring to the ticket is that she's from the electorally rich swing state of Florida. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer is another candidate for the position. While Whitmer does come from an electorally rich state, and one of the states that handed Donald Trump the presidency in 2016, her handling of statewide lockdowns, combined with her inexperience with national politics as she's only had state office, could actually hurt Biden's election chances, with some Michigan residents disapproving and even protesting Whitmer's lockdown orders earlier this year. While New Hampshire Senator Jean Shaheen declined to be vetted for the position, New Hampshire's other female senator, Maggie Hassan, has consented to be vetted. New Hampshire has only four electoral votes, and so does not provide an electorally rich prize for Biden. But Hassan does have an advantage of being only the second woman in United States history, the first being fellow New Hampshire Senator Jean Shaheen, to be elected governor and senator. As such, she has experience as an executive, and arguably more importantly, navigating the halls of Congress to get legislation passed. However, Biden himself served as a senator for over 35 years, and so he certainly already has some of that experience himself. Now, while some say that voters do not pay attention to running mates, this election could prove a turning point with that regard. Given the ages of Donald Trump, who'll be 74 on his inauguration day, and Joe Biden, who'll be 78, the running mates of the two candidates could be much more integral in this election than in the past. So, who do you think that Biden should pick as his running mate? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and be sure to check out our other video where we discuss some of the more mainstream candidates being considered. Anyway, moving on. Biden's proclivity for gaffes may end up being a serious hurdle for the Democratic nominee. On May 26th, in an interview with radio host Charlemagne the God, Biden made these comments. Listen, you got to come see us when you come to New York, VP Biden. Cause it's I a, will. It's a long way until November. We got more questions. You got more okay. questions. But I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, 
and you ain't black. It don't have nothing to do with Trump. It has to do with the fact I want something for my community. I would love to see- Take a look at my record, man. I extended the voting racks 25 years. I have a record that is second to none. The NAACP has endorsed me every time I've run. The war, I mean, come on. As I'm sure you can imagine, Biden's comments gained a lot of criticism from both parties. So it's no surprise that Biden ended up apologizing later that day, saying that he was much too cavalier. Then, a few days later, Biden raised eyebrows again when critics claimed that he said he would beat Joe Biden. Are you prepared now to say you're going to govern as a progressive and enact programs in the mold of Sanders and Warren? And if so, what does that say to, to either moderate Democrats or independents or even some Republicans dissatisfied with President Trump? I'm prepared to say that I have a record of over 40 years and that I'm going to beat Joe Biden. Biden's campaign clarified that he actually said, I'm going to be Joe Biden, not beat. Now, whether or not you agree with the clarifications being given by the Biden campaign, what is clear is that Biden has a history of misspeaking or making statements that he later has to walk back, which could prove difficult for him as the campaign goes on. So what other factors will end up affecting the election? Well, probably one of the biggest factors will be the Trump administration's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. As states begin to reopen, we'll have to wait and see if there's a second spike on the horizon. And if it does happen, voters could blame the president for reopening the country too soon, particularly given the president's continuous, controversial claims that his administration's response to the pandemic has been exemplary. Perhaps more importantly, though, has been Trump's response to the protests following the death of George Floyd at the hands of police in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now, we won't go into any details about his death or about the protests, but you can check out the video we made on that topic if you're interested. There's a link in the description. Anyway, Trump's photo op at St. John's Episcopal Church earned a good bit of criticism particularly after reports surfaced of him using tear gas to disperse a peaceful crowd protesting. In fact, even faith leaders condemned Trump for the move. Now, this type of response isn't without precedent in US political history. In July 1932, then-President Herbert Hoover was seeking re-election when a group of approximately 17,000 World War I veterans and their family marched on DC demanding bonuses that were not paid until 1945. The crowd was dispersed using force, including tanks, cavalry units and tear gas. Coupled with the already crippling effect of the Great Depression, this incident led to Hoover's landslide defeat that year. So, what do you think? Could this be Trump's bonus army moment? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Anyway, the United States essentially functions with two major parties, and we know that will obviously mean that the race is between Trump and Biden. But that sometimes makes it difficult to remember that there are other political parties in the US. On that note, the Libertarian Party recently announced their nominee for the 2020 presidential election, Joe Jurgensen. Jurgensen is a political activist and professor of psychology at Clemson University. Unsurprisingly for a libertarian, Jurgensen is campaigning on reducing the size and scope of the federal government. And although a third party candidate hasn't come close to winning the presidency in modern presidential history, it's worth noting that the Libertarian Party had a surprisingly good performance in 2016, under the leadership of former New Mexico Governor Gary Johnson, garnering 4% of the vote nationally. In fact, some even blamed Hillary Clinton's loss in 2016 on third-party votes in certain states. In Michigan, for example, Donald Trump won the state by just under 11,000 votes, and the Libertarian ticket alone in Michigan gained over 170,000 votes. And this certainly would have been enough to make up the difference for Hillary Clinton. Now, you might also be asking about the Green Party nominee, but the Green Party is expected to hold its national convention in early July meaning that we don't yet know for sure who their nominee will be. The nomination is expected to go to Howie Hawkins, an environmental activist from California. At the time of writing, Hawkins obtained 78% of the delegates required to gain his nomination. The problem that smaller parties will face is ballot access. Candidates must meet qualifications in each state in order to appear on the ballot, and qualifications vary from state to state. 
According to Forbes, the Libertarians have yet to gain placement on 16 state ballots, while the Greens are currently off the ballot in 27 states, although they'll likely gain access to at least some of those before election day. We'll keep you updated on these topics and many others as the election plays out, so be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers for making videos like this one possible.